Okay, hello. So I thought I'd start off on a logically separate subject, although if you've been going to the previous talks, you'll, you'll know that I've been foreshadowing it. Um, so I want to talk about quaternions and octonions. And I've been foreshadowing it because I defined the concept of a norm division algebra last time, which you don't need to know. And I stated this amazing theorem due to, to Hurwitz that there are just four of them, namely the real numbers, the complex numbers, the quaternions, and the octonions. And the, the key property of them is that they have a product and some norm that gets along with the product in this way. So if you've studied real and complex numbers, you're familiar with that kind of identity. And the same kind of thing works for the quaternions and the Arctonians and, and nothing else. So um, I want to explain these algebras, the quaternions and octonions. And there are different ways to do it, but I fairly recently discovered a way to do it for the Arctonians that makes them look very similar to the quaternions and I think easier to understand than the previous ways I, that I'd seen. So Hamilton invented or discovered the quaternions, <clears throat> and you probably know this story. He was struggling for many years to multiply triples of numbers in some nice way, but he was walking along with his wife uh, under a bridge when he suddenly realized that he should be multiplying quadruples. And so the quaternions are a way of thinking about quadruples of real numbers, but we call them not just A, B, C, D, but something like, sorry, let me use the nice system that I want. So A naught plus A one I plus A two J plus A three K. So here are these numbers here, A one, A naught through A three are real numbers. I should add that Hamilton was the first guy to really get the idea that a complex number, you could just think of it as a pair of real numbers. There's no magic to the number i. And so that's what uh, emboldened him to move ahead and then eventually invent quaternions. And, and the key is figuring out how to uh, multiply them. So he made up a formula for how to multiply them. And so the key is to know how to multiply these guys, i, j, and k. One acts as the multiplicative unit. Oh, I didn't stick in the one. You can, if you want, you can stick in a quaternion one. I'll sometimes just leave that out because you can just think of it as a naught by itself. Times one is the same as a naught. So anyway, the key, First of all, is that all these guys are square roots of negative one. And then how the real key, I guess, is how do you multiply the, the pairs of different ones? And so he said, okay, I times J is equal to K, and I'll do cyclic permutations of that equation. And also J times I is negative K and cyclic permutations of that. This is the first time I believe that someone just came along and decided to make up an algebra, to make up some rules for multiplying things. Uh, and of course, the non-commutativity of it was, was particularly exciting. Um, so, so what is, this is like a easy, a softball, easy question for the audience. So what do these things remind you of? these equations here. No? Poly matrices. Sorry? Poly matrices. Okay. Poly matrices were invented when <laughs> physicists, having lost sight of quaternions, invented some two by two matrices that obey the same relation. So that's a perfectly good answer. Pauli probably did know about the quaternions. He was very mathematical. But the, well, and I was looking for some other answer. I'm going to guess a cross product. Yeah, this yeah. you should. I will hope you would just say the vector cross product. The interesting thing is that the quaternions were invented before the vector cross product. 
So he didn't just say like, oh, I'll just use the vector cross product. No, he invented this. Um, and so the point is that we can understand this as follows retroactively by saying that we will think of the quaternions as just being equal to R direct sum R3. So our, our quaternion, we can have a quaternion A and we'll think of it as having a scalar part A naught, which is a real number together with a vector part, which I'll call A arrow. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're doing exactly what I think everyone who teaches vectors these days tells you not to do, which is to uh, what will now make it even more clear. So I will actually, uh, I, I will actually just write this as a naught plus vector part a. So, uh, so that's what you were, yeah. So it took people, there was a huge battle between the quaternionists and the vector lovers who came along later and the vector lovers like Gibbs and Heaviside decided that it didn't, it didn't really help to combine the vector and the scalar part and we should split them up. The quaternionists thought that was heresy, really spoiling the beauty of the unified system of numbers by splitting it in half. Uh, and the vector people had arguments that eventually won that said that you should split them in half. And so whenever you tell your students not to add a vector and a scalar, what you're doing is you're transmitting the winner's side of the story <laughs> down to the next generation so that they never invent quaternions again or something like that. Um, but that's what we're doing. We're adding vectors and scalars. Um, and, but the fun part that makes it worthwhile is how do you multiply quaternions? That's where they, where the vector and scalar parts sort of interact with each other. And so I've got a quaternion and another quaternion and I want to figure out how to multiply them. So each one has a vector, a scalar part and a vector part. And then I'm trying to multiply them. <clears throat> and so I should get something that will have some scalar part and some vector part. And well, since we know different ways of multiplying vectors and scalars now in the aftermath of the triumph of the vector people, I can easily describe what we're going to do here. Basically, we're going to multiply these things using all the different ways that you know about for multiplying scalars and vectors. So I can multiply two scalars, that is just two numbers, just like that. Um, I can multiply, I'll leave a space here because I want to keep the scalar stuff next to each other. I can multiply a scalar and a vector. So I'll do that, a naught times b arrow. I could also do it uh, for b naught times a arrow. If you can stand it, I'm gonna put it on the right there. You, you may have been told never to do that. I don't know, but, but you can certainly multiply it on the right. It just means the same thing as if you multiply it on the left. But, I just want to keep all the A stuff on one side. Um, and then multiplying two vectors, well, we've been told there are two different ways to multiply vectors, the cross product, which gives you a vector, and the dot product that gives you a scalar. So we'll use the cross product and the dot product. So, so we'll get this, to, well, this will give us the vector part of the answer, but then also we need a scalar part. Now, if you think about it, the cross product works perfectly for this, right? When you multiply i and j, that's going to be fine. But you'll notice that i squared and j squared and k squared, that actually should remind you of the dot product, like i dot i is, well, it's one, uh, and j dot j is one and so on. So, but there's a funny little minus sign here. So what we get here is minus the dot product of a and b. So that that's what you need to make i and j and k, which are just the usual basis of, R3. 
uh, be things that would square to negative one. So that's how you multiply quaternions. And so maybe now you can begin to get some sense of why the quaternionists thought it was terrible to break up vectors into these two independent things, vectors and scalars, if you've done other kinds of fancy mathematical systems, you, you know that very often mathematicians will say like, oh, look at this beautiful thing that I have here. And then there are these jerks who like break it apart into lots of little components because they're like, minds aren't big enough to handle the abstraction. So <laughs> of, the, of the simple thing, A times B. So that, that's the attitude that the quaternionists had towards the vector people. Uh, so then there's a theorem, which is not, which is not trivial, which is that, that multiplication is associative. And I'm not going to prove that, because if you've come to previous talks, you know that I hardly ever prove anything in this series. But the proof is really, if you just calculate it, calculate both sides of the associative law and C. And you will use some vector identities involving the dot product and the cross product. And actually, this is a great way to remember all those horrible vector identities if you don't remember them, because you'll just see what identities you need to make this come out to be true. Uh, but 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 this is also like a good test of your oh. Well, it's mainly a good test of how often you taught vector calculus. Sorry, <laughs> if you taught, teach it often, you will know all sorts of rules about dot products and cross products that are what you need here. Um, so then there's more though. We can define conjugation of quaternions. Well, similar to complex conjugation, it's called quaternion conjugation. So the conjugate of a quaternion, what we do is we keep its scalar part the same, but we switch the sign of its vector part. So that, right, so that would mean that like one conjugate is one, but I conjugate is negative I, and so on. So it's a lot like complex conjugation, but you've got, in addition to I, you've got J and K. And then what you can do is you can try to get, I'm going to try to get to the norm on quaternions. So, so what you can do is you can multiply a quaternion by its conjugate and see what happens. So I'm multiplying these two guys. I use this type of rule here. The cross product will vanish because the cross product of a vector with itself goes away. So we are just left with the other terms. But then this is the sort of usual a plus b, a minus b kind of thing. So, so some other stuff cancels too. And so what we're just left with is just a naught squared uh, minus a arrow times a arrow. But that but notice there's a dot product here with a extra minus sign, so we got a plus. So it's a lot like a number of times it's complex conjugate, right? This would be the sum of a naught squared, a one squared, a two squared. Wait, and, and that, means, squared. that means the squared norm of the- Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm reverting to uh, the way this is talked. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, so let me not be so ambiguous like that. Yeah, sorry, that would, that would be that thing to say. Um, so you can do that. And then you can also notice, by the way, that even though the quaternions are not commutative, you can see that if I had multiplied A bar and A in the other order, the calculation piece would be switched, but I get the same answer. So every quaternion commutes with its conjugate. Okay, so then what we can do is we can define a norm on quaternions, just like you would do for the complex numbers, one of the various ways 
that is the way you define the absolute value of a complex number. So what we'll do is we'll define the norm or absolute value of a quaternion to be the square root of it times its conjugate. <clears throat> and it's, it's, it doesn't matter which order. And explicitly what it works out to be then is a not squared plus a one squared plus a two squared plus a three squared. Because, because that's what <clears throat> the stuff in the square root is just this here. So it's just the usual Euclidean norm in four dimensional Euclidean space. An interesting thing is that Hamilton wrote some poems about space and time, and he had some vision that this fourth coordinate here had something to do with time. Uh, and it's very interesting what he thought about. Of course, if you know modern physics, namely special relativity, you know that that's not quite right, that the way it gets space time, the way we see it is you use a kind of norm where you switch the sign of, for example, this guy here. And you need that to make time have a somewhat different quality than space. Uh, so in a sense, quaternions are about some kind of four dimensional space time where there's no difference between space and time. Um, then you get this harmless theorem, which is the real thing that makes the quaternions great. Well, there are, the associativity is already great. This is, there are lots of associative, associative algebras running around the street. A very few of them can claim to be normed division algebras, uh, <clears throat> namely the, this identity here. And again, the proof <laughs> Just consists of calculating it out. But I'll give you a few tips. So square both sides. That's what you have to do, right? Because the norm is defined as a square root. And just calculate them out. So you'll need, again, to use some vector identities to show that, that the two sides work of to be the same. And some of the identities are, I guess, pretty easy, but you'll need to use things like this. You'll need to use that the, the dot product of A <coughs> with the cross product of A and some other vector is zero. That, that, will sh that will show up. I mean, those, those things will show up when you square this, this stuff out. <clears throat> um, and also, you will need to use this nice fact, which is that the usual uh, norm of one vector squared times the norm of the other vector squared. So here I'm using the ordinary norm for vectors in three-dimensional space, which is just the, <clears throat> the norm squared is the dot product of the thing of itself. I just want to write it this way to keep it short. So, so there's this nice formula that this is equal to the norm of the cross product of them squared plus the um, absolute value of the dot product squared. So if you don't make a living teaching calculus to kids or vectors to kids, you might not remember this identity uh, or if you don't use it. This is a beautiful identity, right? So if two vectors are pointing the same way, this is big and this is zero, two vectors are pointing at right angles, this is zero and this is big, but somehow 
they combine to give just the product with the norm squared. Isn't that cos squared plus sine squared? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this that's how, I mean, well, if you if you believe that, <laughs> then that's that's one way to prove it. Yeah, I mean, there are other ways to, to prove it, of course. One way to prove it is just like multiply it all out. I actually do that to my classes, uh, and they that's like one of the most unpleasant days in the whole course because uh, you get lots of terms. But yeah, it's it's it's. Yeah, it's just cos squared plus sine squared equals one. John, a question. Yes. Um, so you gave two definitions of multiplication. You began by giving it, giving it on the presentation with, with I, you know, saying yeah. what I yeah. is and so on. Um, so these theorems that multiplication is associative and preserves the norm, are they um, easier or harder if you use that definition of multiplication? Try and find out. Try and find out. Do it both ways and you'll see which one you think is easier. Um, I, I like, I like, the, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't like for associativity. I don't know if I have a for associativity. Maybe the bare method, just using i's, j's, and k's, is easier because although in principle, right, you've got four basis vectors that you want to check associativity on, and so you're doing four cubed sixty-four calculations. It sounds pretty unpleasant, but there's so much symmetry in the situation that you'll soon see like ah, they're like all the same. We've seen one, we've seen them all. So it's not that bad, and 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 proving associativity using this definition may stress your 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 skills and vectors or something like that. But uh, yeah, the associativity I think does take a little bit of work. I don't know like a super slick proof of the associative law, which I guess I should find out find one. Um, Could you do it for I J and K individually? For which? The associative law? Yeah. Yeah, for associative law, like I said. Just got to check all the IJ cases. Yeah, you know, you see there's IIJ and JJI and IJI and JIJ. And, and you soon say like, ah, by symmetry, a whole bunch of those work sort of the same <laughs> way. So they're not nearly as many cases as you might fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you'll just sort of quit halfway through the proof and say like, ah, this is obvious, right? That's one of those kind of proofs. Um, so, okay, so this is, so this anyway is, is really crucial. Um, so one thing it gives you is that, uh, if you have a quaternion that's not zero, it has an inverse a left and right inverse. What it is, is you take its conjugate and then you multiply by the real number one over the norm of it squared. So that's just the formula for the inverse of a complex number that you've already probably seen. We're just using the same idea. And it's sort of easy to see why it, why it works. Let me just Show you why it works. So, <clears throat> so if I multiply a and this claimed inverse, so multiplying, we have a vector space. So multiplying by real numbers, you can commute with everything. So you can pull that out, pull out that one over one over a squared, and you put this. But well, that is the norm of a squared. This a times a bar is the norm of a squared. Um, so this claimed, claimed inverse here really is the inverse. And then also, it's, it's also um, an inverse on the other side because. Um, Well, because I, I I showed you that a a bar is the same as a bar a, so if we had it in the other order, it would still work. So everything non-zero has an inverse. So that's why norm division algebras are called division algebras. They have this norm that is gets along with multiplication in a certain way, but that then implies that they they are division algebras. Um, and so 
we get various other nice spin-offs from this. Like one consequence is that um, if you take the three sphere thought of as the quaternions, so quaternions are a four-dimensional vector space, but if you take the quaternions whose norm is equal to one, so that will be a three sphere, then these will be a group because they have inverses and their inverse of one of norm one will also have norm one. I guess I should turn that. That now. I mean, we see that the quaternions of norm one are closed under multiplication by the norm division law. So. But also this inverse. So if you have a guy of norm one, the norm of its inverse, you got to check that that's as norm one as well. I guess I just, I guess I just write down what that is. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, this is taking too long, but, <laughs> but, but this norm here is the, there it's, but that's the same as the norm of A. So it's one. So I probably didn't need so many steps if I was smarter. Um, so, so the three sphere is a group. It's a group, but it's also a manifold. And these operation, this operation of taking inverses is smooth, except at the origin where the where you're dividing by zero. So it's a Lie group. Group that's a manifold. And now you know a couple of other spheres that are Lie groups, I claimed. And I claim that the word couple <laughs> is precise. Because you better not know three more. <laughs> uh, you need two. Mm. Math is wrong. Uh, so, so, um, so, other, so, yeah, so the, there are two other, there are just two other spheres that are Lie groups. That's a hard, this is a hard <laughs> theorem. The hard part is showing that these are the only ones. This is some pretty serious topology, but it's easy to see what the candidates are. So if you take S0, the zero sphere is just all the real numbers of norm one that are known as the numbers plus one and minus one. That's a group that are known as E mod two. And then there's the one sphere, which are the complex numbers of norm one. So we know that they're going to be circle. So S0, S1, and S3 are spheres. Did I screw up? What? Oh, it's like Z is complex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's called Z, it must be complex. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So there's like this whole joke, like, the, the professor says, let P be a prime number. And then the student says, well, what if it's not prime? And the professor says, well, then I wouldn't have called it P now, would I? <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so so these these three different spheres are, are groups and it's a harder theorem that these are the only ones. Okay, now I'm gonna get to the Octonians. So, <clears throat> I mean, there's tons more to say about Octonians. Basically, it's a very nice framework for three and four dimensional <clears throat> Euclidean geometry and a kind of unified 
package. And in fact, video game designers who are trying to rotate objects and code their coordinates using you can code the rotations using quaternions instead of three by three matrices because they're more efficient. So if you believe that video game design justifies mathematics, then there you go. Um, so, and it certainly does justify it. I mean, most, I guess a whole bunch of advanced computer technology is like done in order to make video games. So, turning this too. So, but the, so instead of going into any more about the math of quaternions, I'll just go straight to the Octonians. So there's like different communities of people. I move in some weird circle of people where like everybody knows about quaternions, uh, but Octonians, now that's a little interesting. Um, so here is the idea. You just replace R in what I've just been doing by C. Now you have to be a little clever about that. We could just like say in all these formulas that I've been writing down, with like for quaternion multiplication here, make these vectors be guys not in R3, but in C3. You can define the cross product in C3 just like you can in R3. If you do that, and you don't get the octonians. So if you if you don't change the multiplication rule at all, So if you don't change the if you don't change this formula here, you don't change this guy at all, just using complex numbers and complex vectors, what you get, you get an algebra. It's the quaternions tensored with the complex numbers. There's a thing you can do with algebras, which is tensor them and form new algebras, and switching to some fancier coefficients by complex numbers just means you're tensoring with complex numbers. But this is isomorphic to the algebra of two by two complex matrices, it turns out. So it's not the Octonians. In particular, it would be associative. Yeah, we want that. We want a non-associative algebra. <laughs> we don't really want a non-associative algebra. We want a, a norm to division algebra, and it will have to be non-associative. Um, so we know right away that this isn't going to give us the Octonians. Um, but the idea is that what you want to do is change a couple of things. So replace the dot product. See, there's no way we're going to get a norm with all its sort of po usual positivity properties of the norm if we don't change this dot product a little, right? If in, in R3, the dot product of a vector with itself is always greater than or equal to zero, and that's part of what's making the, the A times its conjugate be non-negative number. Uh, but when you work with complex numbers, if you do this kind of thing, this could be negative. So what we'll do is we'll replace it by the obvious thing, the complex inner product of A and B. Now, in this talk, unlike some previous talks, I'm going to use the yucky math convention for inner products. It doesn't really matter, but just so I don't screw something up, I'll do that. That is, I put the conjugate on the second argument, even though it offends me to do so. This is like it and the other one, but it doesn't really matter. So we'll replace it with that. Okay, so that thing has the property that for for complex vectors, it's the inner product of anything with itself is greater than or equal to zero. But then you also have to do one other thing. Well, actually a couple of other things, but also you have to change the cross product to something different. I've never seen a, anyone make up a notation for this, but I'm going to call it a cross product with a bar over it here. Well, what is it? So this is, again, this is for vectors A and B in C3. 
So what is this funny kind of new cross product of them? So here is its cross product. I'll take the i component of it, and I'll tell you what it is. The i component of it is just this. We take the usual cross product that is defined by the usual formula for cross products, uh, and then you take its i component, and then you complex conjugate it. So you take the cross product, and then you complex conjugate each of the three entries. So that's what you've got to do. Now, there are nice mathematical stories about why that's what you should do. Um, I'll just briefly say that when you get fancy, you learn that like the cross product is sort of a spin off of something more fundamental called the wedge product of vectors. And the wedge product of two different vectors is something like a, a, a two form, or maybe you might call it a bivector. And then there's a trick for converting it into a vector in three dimensions, and the cross product is what results from doing that. And it, and that trick for converting a two form into a vector uses the dot product when you're in R3. And if you just adjust that trick so that it uses this kind of inner product, then you get this kind of mutant cross product. So, uh, so basically, if you're willing to countenance a bit of uh, exterior algebra, Rossmann variables, these are just different names for the same thing, two forms, then, then it's like you see that this is not just an arbitrary, goofy thing to do. Okay, um, so then the formula, oh look, I didn't plan this all out. So this formula here for multiplication will look almost the same so we have to replace this thing with the, this is one of these tricks that lecturers love more than the audiences, right? Because anyone taking notes is like, oh no, I've got to copy this with this for Whereas the lecture is going, ha ha ha, I don't have to write it. Yeah. So offloading work. Uh, so, okay, so we'll do that. And then of course, we'll replace this with this new mutant cross product. But then there's one other funny little thing to do that we need to do, which is that we have to take the conjugate, the complex conjugate there. Um, and again, there's like, there is a story for why we have to do these <laughs> modifications. Only there. Only there, yeah. Crazy. Yeah, so it's like almost the same sort of, well, I just changed it in three out of five places. <laughs> I'm trying to make it seem, but honestly, if you hear anyone else explain the Actonians, it's gonna seem more complicated and mysterious than this. That is here, at least if you bought Quaternions, you're like willing to get, pay five bucks extra and get Actonians too, right? <laughs> uh, so it's, it works like that. Um, and so, um, well, there's like an easy theorem, which you just have to do by calculation, which is that, that this multiplication is not associated. In other words, you can check this with some randomly chosen example of multiplying three things that it will not typically be associated. So that's the bad news. In fact, the term associative was invented precisely to castigate the Octonians. I think I mentioned this once before in this series. So Hamilton, e I said email the last time too. Hamilton emailed his <laughs> pal, uh, uh, John Graves, who was a lawyer. They both went to Cambridge together and studied maths there, but, but, but Graves went on to be a lawyer uh, and told him, I've invented the Quaternions. And then, and then Graves thought for a while and he invented the Octonians. Uh, he said like, with your magic, you can create three bricks of gold out of thin air. I could create seven uh, <laughs> because there are seven square roots of minus one in, in the Octonians. Uh, and then Hamilton said like, well, that's really interesting, but this algebra is not associative. And that's the moment the word associative was born. Uh, so 
And so, yeah, and so Hamilton promised to deliver a talk about Octonians for graves at the Irish Royal Society, which is how things were published back then. But he never did it. He like completely forgot to do it. Um, so um, I just say that it is something sort of second best. It's what's called alternative. Namely, that if you have the associative law with two of the arguments being the same, the associative law still holds. So that's actually remarkably uh, useful. That is, it's it's a, well, it's a sort of funny business, but you and you can sort of when you get into this weird into this weird game. You sort of learn how much math can you do when you're only multiplying two really different numbers. Uh, and as long as you're just dealing with two numbers, you still have associativity. It's an interesting thing. Yeah. Yep. So can I just go back to the uh, definition of multiplication? Yeah. So, well, one thing you've now got two uh, definitions full stop. But anyway. Um, <laughs> So the, the, the one before you changed it was called star as well. Oh, but, okay. Uh, no, but that wasn't the point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so you've got um, A arrow times B zero bar as the fourth term in that. Yes. Okay. Uh, is, is that equal to B zero times A arrow? If you don't put the bar on it. No, I mean, th this is normal, well, semi-normal, multiplication of complex vectors by complex scalars. This is just another funny way. So like, if you like your scalars in front, this is just another way of writing that. So there's like no funny identities to involve there. The only reason why I like writing it this way here is that I like to think of the complex vectors as a bimodule of the complex numbers now where the left multiplication is the usual one, but the right multiplication structure has this bar in it. That is like, a, turns out to be a bimodule structure. Uh, so that's the fancy stuff I said. Is there is there a nice letter with a bar on it for the Quaternion? Yes. 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 It was H for the Quaternion. Yeah, no, it's unfortunately Graves didn't get, oh, didn't get it. And, and then Cayley reinvented them. And then they were called the Cayley numbers for a long time. But of course, you can't call that C. Uh, and, and so anyway, now people usually call it O for octonians. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, that's, that's what people call it. Um, Sorry, John, I did. Yeah. Missed the definition of the last term. What this? Bar over the cross here? OK, so yeah. it, it was. Pull your blackboard down. Is it down there? Yeah. Right there? I forgot. Here it is. Ah, thanks. So you take the. You use the usual recipe for cross product, but now with complex vectors instead of real ones. And then at the last minute, you, you, you conjugate your three components. Yeah, thanks. And thank you, Simon. <laughs> so, um, oops, it's gone now. So, so uh, yeah, so then the, the, the key to making why you care about any of this stuff is that. The Octonians are a normed division algebra. That is, you have, oh, oh, sorry, I should say you define the norm the same way. And it's still true, by the way. This is a little mini proposition here that doesn't matter what order you multiply the quaternion and its conjugate, they commute. So, as this doesn't change. And then you get this routine result, which is that the norm of a product is the product of the norms. That's what makes the quaternion, the Octonians, be called a normed division algebra. And the good news is that the proof of this one 
is basically just like for the quaternions. So it's the same calculation. Of course, there are these little bars running around, but they don't destroy the flow of the calculation. They just work out just right and all the stuff fine. So, so using using the same sort of identities. Now, of course, you may not know the identities for this slightly mutant version of the of the dot product and the cross product. But for example, it's true that the inner product of A with this funny cross product equals zero, et cetera. So the, the identities sort of work the same and have follow the same patterns. Yes? A couple of questions from Zoom. Sure. Um, uh, so one, shouldn't A zero be conjugated to in the definition of conjugation of octonians? Oh, you're right. You're right. It should. Thanks so much. I was busy thinking about like how it shouldn't come to that. You're right. That's incredible. Yeah, that's confusing too, right? Uh, yeah, so I guess I'll write this. So this is like, remember here, A naught was just a complex number. And then A bar is the usual conjugate. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, okay. And Good. Other... <laughs> yeah. You can thank Egbert for that. Um, hey, great, thanks. Um, and then, is it is it right to say that, uh, that the multiplication rule for octonians is simply just more general than the one for quaternions? In that, if they are all real, yeah, yeah. So if, yeah, so if your guys in C and C three happen to be real, then this is the same as the quaternion multiplication. So so you get this beautiful, um, very standard set of inclusions. R contained in C contained in H contained in O. Yeah, that's right. It's very nice how it works that way. Um, right. So, so one of the so I'll just mention a couple other things. One of which is that um, so every octonium that's non-zero has again a two-sided inverse. Just the same, find the same sort of way, A versus just run over the norm of A squared times A conjugate. <clears throat> That's the Antonian conjugate there. And then also, we get in the same kind of way that the seven sphere is closed under multiplication. And has inverse and inverses. So what's the multiverse? Well, so it's a non-associative group. Uh, okay. If you're willing to countenance such a terrible phrase, so in that they're, they're allowed to add properties to a mathematical structure, but it's really against the rules to subtract them. Because when you subtract them, you might like accidentally rip out some piece that you didn't intend to. So, so, but nonetheless, if you take nine out of 10 definitions of group, there's one law there that's the associative law, and you just cross that one out, and that's what we get here. Well, so there's a name for that. It's a loop. Now, this is a terrible name because loop means so many other things, but if you want information about non associative groups, you we look under a loop. Um, so it's a loop, but it's also a manifold. And the operations are smooth. So people don't tend to say this, but it's a leap. It is a mean <laughs> <laughs> um, And so it turns out that it's the only sphere that's a Lee loop, except for the ones that are the Lee groups. So, so the only so the only spheres that are leading to the ones you've seen today. Good. What's the name of that center? Was it made to run? Lee and loop? No, group and loop. Oh, group and loop. <laughs> I didn't think Lee and loop were rhyme, <laughs> but they said this sort of sound cool together. Um, I don't know, actually. I think, yeah, I don't know. Sorry, I don't know. I'll find out. Um, one thing that 
Yeah, so one last little thing is, well, I don't know. Uh, if you're into topology, you'll know that some manifolds have a tangent bundle being trivial, meaning that you don't need to, you can just, that the tangent bundle is just a product of the manifold in some vector space. And, and Lie groups are, all have that property, but Lie loops do too. So all these guys have trivial tangent bundles, and they're the only spheres that have trivial tangent bundles, it turns out. Uh, so there's a lot more to say about this, but I'll stop here. The more to say is like, okay, now we've got these octonians, what the heck do we do with these darn things? And that's another longer story, which I can't tell right now, but I'll stop here. Thanks. Yeah, so what goes off the rails if you were to like, Plenty of multiplication, you just say it's from like left to right. So you say you just like multiply, you have like a string of uh -huh. and and you say forget it, I'm not gonna worry about them because I'm just gonna do it from left to right or right to left or something like that. Right. What 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 would you get? I mean I mean, I mean the reason I asked you I mean what you're doing is you're just saying like do exactly what you're doing, but think about it for this convention that you don't need to write parentheses when you, if they're ever all the parentheses are maximally pushed over to the left. The only people I've ever heard talk about that kind of thing are computer scientists who talk about left associative structures, which means like they're not associative, but I'm always going to put my all my parentheses to the left. And so hopefully most of the time I don't have to worry about it as long as the next thing I multiply is on the right. <laughs> uh, so you don't really get anything out of that that's not present already. It could be like, maybe if you're like writing down tons of formulas with octonians and you didn't want to write lots of parentheses, you might adopt that convention. But it means you can like put them in majors. Uh, no, you can't, no, no. I mean, it's not really associative. I mean, no, no, no terminal lot. Yeah, so people sometimes think like, oh, could you describe octonian multiplication as like there are, you know, some special kind of eight by eight uh, matrices of real numbers with ordinary matrix multiplication. And the answer is no, of course not, because matrix multiplication is associated. So you cannot describe octonians as matrices or in some associated algebra. And no little tricks like saying, I'm gonna push all my parentheses over to the left will like let you no, wriggle out of that. What? I meant you could put them into the entries of the matrices. You know? Yeah, you can look at matrices of octonians. Three by three matrices of octonians have amazing properties. There's this thing called the exceptional Jordan algebra, which is self-adjoint three by three matrices of, of octonians. So yeah, you can do things with matrices of octonians. Um, there's a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good question. The first one was whenever you talk about, you can talk about real algebras. Uh, yeah. When you introduce octonians and first have the multiplication for the major. Yeah, I'm thinking of them as a real algebra, even though I was sort of using the complex numbers. But the fact that there's complex conjugation thrown in the formula there means that that multiplication is not complex linear in, in the two arguments. So we're using sort of the complex numbers as a trick to get at the octonians, but it's just a real algebra, not a, a real non associated algebra, not a Complex. But is it, uh, I mean, this is going to get formula wrong, but is it still scale up multiplication by complex number in the first argument still for that one second? Ah, uh, did I get rid of that formula? I'm oh, sorry, I erased it. I, you can tell almost as fast as I could. It looks like maybe the, it's complex linear in the first variables and conjugate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's conjugate linear. And, yeah. And then for stage one, you said um, it's not associated with something else. Um, alternative. alternative. Yeah. So, it's the alternative to associated algorithms. So if you have A and B and your third term being one of A and B, everything is associated. Right. Um, as far as I see, you can also replace the third one by some linear combination. Right. Linear. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And you can also, by the way, replace it by any. You can throw conjugates in there as well, is and it'll some, still work. Is there some sentence coming out of that along the lines of some too complex dimensional algebra? 
is always and it, an equivalent definition. So I wrote three identities down for an alternative algebra. There's like a highbrow definition that's not so obviously equivalent to the lowbrow definition, which is that an algebra is alternative if the subalgebra generated by any two elements is associated. So it's easy to see that if that fancy definition holds, then those three identities hold, because those were examples of things in the subalgebra generated by A and B. But it's not so obvious that just those three identities imply that the whole subalgebra generated by two elements is associated. But it's true. It's some theorem of all. So, so maybe, maybe seeing as you have many, many questions, yeah, maybe yeah. talk to John afterwards. Yeah, um, I guess there's, we have to, we get kicked out of the room at some point. We should, we should wrap up in case other people right have now. four o'clock appointments. Yeah, um, okay. a, a very important thing next week, there's a strike at that one no seminar. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, we'd love to answer that. <laughs>